And I've listened, unfortunately, to a few writers and authors who are adults now and, and they put everything on the back burner for so long simply because a teacher said the wrong thing to them or put their writing down at one stage and it made them stop. And so I'm really, really aware of that. And the part of teaching that I'm really passionate about is getting the kids excited to write. And so for me, where the key to enjoying writing comes from is being engaged. And I think where I'm successful in the classroom is because I'm so passionate about writing. So that enthusiasm comes into the class and I try and look at creative ways to engage the kids as well, to get them just as excited. And they, they do, their energy tends to feed off mine a little bit. And so that's a real positive thing. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 297 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have a chat with Joe Buer, a gothic suspense and literary fiction author from New Zealand who describes herself as a sucker for the supernatural, time travel, and all things woo-woo. Well, I describe Joe as powerfully inspiring and enthusiastic about helping other writers find their passion and their own best ways to make it in this business. We have a delightful conversation about that, her bookish ways and life, and more. And that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, if you're not familiar with Findaway Voices, it is a platform that allows authors to get their audiobooks out into the global market. If you're looking for a professional narrator, they have a Voices Marketplace where they have thousands of narrators listed. You can find them by genre, by style, by accents. You can listen to samples. You can find what their price points are, their price ranges, and you can basically request a sample from them. That's just one of the ways you can use Findaway Voices. Once you get the narrator, of course, you can use Voices Share, where there are some authors who are willing to take less of a payment up front for a bit of a royalty split on that book published through Findaway Voices. Or you can purchase the audio from a narrator directly yourself or finding them through Findaway Voices Marketplace use Findaway Voices to distribute. Now, they can get your audiobook into more than 43 retail and library platforms. You can also get access to special promos and coupon codes. For example, coupon codes so people can get your books for free on Spotify. And yay, Spotify is now available to us Canadians. Oh, the audiobook store, Spotify has been long available for us here in Canada, but audiobooks on Spotify are now available to Canadians, so that's really exciting. And you can get your uh, promos and price promos on numerous retailers, including Chirp, which is owned by BookBub. You can set your own price deals. You can apply to be in Chirp audiobook deals through BookBub, but you have to be published through Findaway Voices to get them into Chirp. There's just so many ways you can leverage Findaway Voices. There's so many ways you can leverage your audiobooks. And if you want to see how you can leverage your audiobooks as an author, you can check out Findaway Voices over at StarkReflections.ca slash Findaway. Okay, in terms of personal update, I'm just going to kind of skip through personal update. I've got uh, Hex in the City was out. Um, we had it discounted for a while 
also still have Lover's Moon discounted, uh, and these are discounted at 99 cents, you know, US, GBP, Euros, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand. We just went dot ninety nine, you know, across across the board in those English language territories, and we're still. It's kind of funny because I haven't really seen any reviews come in after after the uh, the increase in downloads and, and promotions. But you know, it sometimes takes people a while to get to those books. So I'm hoping that that comes soon. But in the meantime. I am in the process of, you know, doing some work, uh, preliminary work at least, on on the next Canadian werewolf book, Only Monsters in the Building. I have I have three other titles on my whiteboard for this series that just come to me. They're play on words on on other other titles. So meet. Pray and Love is one of them, uh, which I think would be quite funny. Uh, but anyways, that's just uh, one of the things. Who knows what, what that one's going to be about. Maybe it's going to be a novella or a short story. Who knows? But I just, I had to write it down because I, uh, I thought it was funny. But um, I am now getting very serious, as, as I've said many times, about working on that next nonfiction book uh, about Die Hard because the 35th anniversary is coming up in July. And of course, I have to... <laughs> I actually have to write that book now uh, because I'm going to have to get it edited and all the things <laughs> so uh, so that it can be ready for July. So, yeah, I really I really need to get down and dirty on that uh, throughout the month of April. I am also in the throes of getting caught up on my tax. I uh, submitted my 2020 tax details to my uh, accountant who who helps uh, file my taxes for me he, he finds all the things that I, I miss out on so I provide all those details um, uh, and and I'm preparing my 2021 and then that way I can be fully caught up fully pay what I owe on on my taxes for 2020 and 2021 so that I can file my 2022 taxes on time and get everything back on track. Oh boy, the life of a procrastinator. But uh, that's kind of it for a personal update. I just want to uh, skip uh, comments again for this episode. Not because I don't love your comments. I do love the comments and I do love the reflections that you guys have been sending in both text and audio. I've got a, an interesting mix coming up for episode 300 because there's only yeah, three episodes to go two more episodes and then episode 300 the big episode 300 and uh this is after six years of running the podcast i'm very thrilled that i'm going to be able to share all of those awesome reflections in episode 300 so uh, that is it but there's still time to get your reflections in and there'll be a link again in the show notes at stark reflections.ca and a huge thank you to everyone who has already submitted their wonderful reflections. I cannot wait to share them. But that's it for the introductory matter. Oh my god, did I get it done in less than 10 minutes? I'm so proud of myself. Yay! Because you know what that means? That means you get to hear from Joe Buer way earlier than normal. Because usually I kind of go on and on and on like I am right now, you know, for about 15, sometimes 18 minutes. But no, no, you get to get to listen to this conversation with Joe a lot earlier. See, isn't that awesome? Joe, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. I am so excited to be here, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm turning the tables on you because um, you are a podcast host. You are a writer, you're a teacher, you have some experience as a librarian and bookseller. You're just, just bookish all the way around, aren't you? I am. I've wanted to be in the world of books ever since I can remember. So I've yeah. dabbled in a little bit of everything. Yeah. Okay, well, take us take us back. Take us back to that first uh, inkling or sparkling uh, of of creative energy that led you to want to be a writer. Honestly, I can go all the way back to when I was like five years old, and um, we start school at five here in New Zealand, and I was getting a tour of the school and. Uh, I was showing the library, the school library, and it was this really small closet size thing. But I mean, I was five years old and there were just books to the ceiling and something just absolutely spoke to me. Like I just felt like I'd walked into a different world and I couldn't read anything. Right. But it just felt magical. Yeah. So <laughs> wow. I, I've okay. just, 
yeah, books are my thing. <laughs> books are your thing. And then, so, so you had that spark when you were five. When, when did you actually start to experiment with writing? Well, it, it's funny because I can still going back to really young, like I was six years old when it was my sixth birthday and uh, in class, we all had to write us, you know, stories, which were like maybe two sentences if we're lucky. And I remember writing about a gift I was given. This was back in the 1980s. So it was a My Little Pony. And I, my whole aim for writing was I believed I was just going to blow everyone's socks off (laughs) and just astound my teacher. And then when she came around to check on my work, um, she'd want me to read it aloud to the class or she'd read it aloud to the class and everyone would applaud. And I don't know where I got this idea from but at the age of six I was just like my writing is the best on the planet and so I wrote my little story which was probably something like I got a My Little Pony for my birthday and it was brown or something like that and um, I thought that I was going to make it extra special by doing it all in uppercase letters because that in my mind was somehow more adult so I was going to do it in uppercase And I remember I was very, very shy and I was waiting patiently for the teacher to come around to me. And I couldn't wait because I just, I just knew she was going to love my story. And um, she got to me and I was so nervous and so excited. And she told me off because I'd used all capital, all uppercase letters. And I remember being not only devastated, but also this part of me was like, um, well, I'm going to show you. So yeah, I just kind of got this this stubbornness and that I wasn't appreciated at that time, but one day I would be. And I would like to say from then on, I just wrote all the time and it was really easy, but I didn't. I I wrote all the um, angsty poetry and everything growing up as you do right. and some stories and things. And then I got all the real jobs. I guess, Mm -hmm. and um, wanted to be a writer, wanted to be an author, but kept putting off, kept pushing it aside to do what was expected of me. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So at what point did you, uh, as I understood it, you published your first book in 2020, right? Yeah, I did. So, yeah, so I was, um, yeah, uh, yeah, 39, I guess, 39, 40. Um, so it took a long time for me to right. publish my first book and that ended up being a collection of short stories primarily okay. as a reader magnet. But that's when I decided to take writing seriously. Right. And yeah, I I had done a few courses. I'd done some university courses and things like that. And I'd had a couple of stories published in a literary journal here in New Zealand. Okay. But it wasn't until 2020 that life kind of pushed me to get off my backside and to, yeah, to either do do it or don't do it, but stop talking about it. So, Well, well, I'm of two minds here because you had obviously been writing and writing short fiction and submitting them to markets to get them published. So you had already gotten off your backside. But you're talking about in 2020, was it was it the pandemic? Was that part of the instigation? Not really, no. no? <laughs> Believe it or not. It wasn't really. Um, and it's funny because I talked to a lot of authors who are all like 2020 was the year that really pushed me to doing it. Right. So yeah, I had um put a couple of short stories in that out previously, but I hadn't taken myself seriously as a writer or an author. I didn't have any confidence behind that. So I was at the time, the job, like the day job that I was in was not a particularly positive environment. It was pretty, pretty nasty to be honest. And um, I found myself in the worst kind of, situation I'd ever experienced with my self-esteem being really feeling really kind of beaten up and quite destroyed and what is the point of it all and Mm. yeah just in a really dark place and I didn't have um except for a family and a few friends outside of my day job I didn't really feel like I had a lot of um people kind of supporting me right and 
that kind of that little voice that I kind of heard when I was six years old kicked in and was kind of like, well, screw you all. I'm going to, you know, like if I can't be happy doing what I'm doing, you know, that pays the bills and that, then I'm going to, you know, life's too short. I've got nothing to lose. People seem to be taking a disliking to me anyway. So I'm just going to put myself out there. And it was kind of a, yeah, I, I can't really explain it, but I was in yeah. such a dark, dark place that it just almost gave me permission to fail. So it gave me permission to just do it and to stop holding myself back. And yeah, so then I went on and I did all the research into indie publishing and uh, put together a reader magnet and learned how to do all that and got a professional editor and then started working on some novels as well. So, oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now at this point in time, now we're talking in early 2023 and you will mm. always be a day ahead of me uh, or most, most of the day ahead of me anyways <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in Canada. You, how many uh, books and story collections do you have out now? So I have two short story collections and two novels and I have a third novel that I'm just waiting to get back from my editor Ooh. and a novella that um, will be out in the world shortly and is also going to be in a um, collection of short stories with some other authors as well. So yeah, so I'm feeling rather prolific, even though that's nothing compared to a lot of people in three right. years, but I still have a day job. I have a different day job, but okay. um, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm doing okay considering the other demands in my life. So yeah. So wait a second, you already have four books out and a fifth one on the way, and you're saying that you don't feel very prolific. I mean, that's that's more than a book a year right? <laughs> when you look at it that I way, guess right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess when you look at that, I think um, what it is, is one of the things I probably struggle with the most is I see myself as a full-time author, right? but I've actually only got the part-time hours. Okay. So because I, I try, you know, I want, I have so many great, you know, so many ideas that I'm excited to put out into the world. And so many books to write. And um, I fit this around a full-time job. So I only really have the part-time hours to live that full-time author life, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, I wish I just had, you know, a few more books out. And right. yeah, yeah. So you're criticizing yourself as if you were a full-time author, forgetting the fact that you were a part-time author with a full-time job. Okay. Yeah, kind of. I know. That's silly. It's definitely yeah. something that I'm working on with my mindset this yeah. year that's one of my goals because I have been really pushing it when I decided in 2020 that I want to be an author and I want to eventually make this as a living and whatnot right. uh, I really went all in and I tried to mirror uh, a lot of people who are doing this full-time and have a lot right. more hours available to them course, yeah um, yeah, and that doesn't work. <laughs> so if you're listening to that and you're trying to do that, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. I feel like no. I want to write a, a very impassioned note to you in all upper case letters that says, <laughs> Joe, cut yourself some slack, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things, though, that when you're really passionate about it, like when you really love doing something, it's just what you want to do. Yeah. So, yeah. And so that's my thing is um, I find it difficult to put the brakes on because I am really passionate about writing. I love it. Yeah. Oh, good. I love that. I love to hear that because that means succeed or fail and I don't mean fail but succeed or yeah. succeed big or succeed small <laughs> you, yeah. you win either way right because you're doing something that you absolutely love absolutely absolutely so there there is no there is no failing um yeah. whether I'm making lots of money and do this as a living or not I'm still going to be doing this right. so yeah yeah I love that yeah. I love that so what genre do you write like what are the novels and um, typically the short stories uh, are they in a, one specific genre or do you move about uh, I, I would like to say they're in one genre I have a little bit of difficulty kind of um pinpointing what that genre is they're quite gothic in mood and a little bit literary as well so that is for my short stories and my two novels out at the moment uh, and then I 
thought I'd try something a bit different. And I have um, a book at my editor at, with my editor at the moment, and that's a paranormal cozy, oh, which is wow. quite different because okay. I'm used to <laughs> writing a little bit darker and a little bit more serious. And yeah. now, yeah, but it was so it was so fun to write. Wow, it was so see, fun to write. <laughs> I was thinking with uh, a podcast of the title Alchemy for Authors, I would have thought that you would have already gotten involved in writing paranormal if not cozy it's just paranormal in general with a with a word like that right but so let i, I want to go so you've got this podcast alchemy for authors mm -hmm. in which you're obviously wanting to inspire other authors but you, also as a teacher I, I i can't help but wonder at the inspiration that you inflict upon <laughs> upon children who are inspired and yeah. to be creative and I and I wonder how that ties back to your own experience where you had the the thrill and the passion and the anticipation that you were going to be discovered as a genius, a pure genius, a creative <laughs> talent. <laughs> I mean, that's good because what a teacher does and how a teacher reacts to that burst of creativity and passion can really can really have a long term effect, can it? It really can. And I've listened, unfortunately, to a few writers and authors who are adults now, and, and they put everything on the back burner for so long, simply because a teacher said the wrong thing to them or put their writing down at one stage, and it made them stop. Right. And so I'm really, really aware of that. And the part of teaching that I'm really passionate about is getting the kids excited to write. And particularly, particularly the boys, because we, we have a bit of a thing in New Zealand, and I don't know if it's the same in education systems around the world, but uh, our, our boys seem to fall a little bit behind when it comes to literacy and yeah. writing. And so for me, where the key to enjoying writing comes from is being engaged. And I think where I'm successful in the classroom is because I'm so passionate about writing. So that enthusiasm comes into the class and I try and look at creative ways to engage the kids as well, to get them just as excited. And they they do, their energy tends to feed off mine a little bit. And so that's a real positive thing. Yeah, yeah. I can I can see that because I can feel the enthusiasm, uh, you know, from the other side of the globe through the digital. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel the enthusiasm that you have, not just for writing, but for teaching writing. Yeah, yeah. I, and so that was one of the reasons that I started my podcast, Alchemy for Authors, because it really does take it really did take me out of my comfort zone. I'm not used to yeah. um I'm very introverted. And so talking to other people and making conversation was kind of tricky yeah. at the beginning, but I just love it. It's learning from other authors and yeah, you, I can take away so much, but in putting these episodes out there, whether it's my solo episodes or episodes where I'm interviewing other people, I'm hoping that I can encourage and inspire them to make those moves and take a chance on themselves and to move through any blocks that are kind of holding them back because right. most of it is mindset or it's all really mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when, before we started the official interview, we were chatting and you had shared a, a, a nugget of wisdom about one of the underlying fundamental mindset shifts that you would like to help people with. Can you, can you share a little bit of that right now? Yeah. So it really is to not overthink things. So there's a few things that I think new authors in particular, or a lot of us that have always been inspired by the idea of writing a book or writing in general or anything like that. And we put it off and we push it aside. And that's because something in us tells us that it's got to be perfect or we're not good enough or you know, so we come up with excuses, whether it's excuses of, well, I can't spell or I don't have time or there's some kind of thing that we feel like we're lacking. And honestly, it's all nonsense. It really comes down to our own confidence. And so my advice and what has worked for me has uh, definitely been trying to push all that aside. When it comes to my writing, I try to have a really positive mindset about it 
And it's funny because I tend to think of myself as a bit of a pessimist in most areas of my life, but I refuse to bring that to my writing because, <laughs> you know, it just, it means so much to me is that you've got to push away that perfectionism. And I really do believe in just getting words on the page. You can make it pretty and all that good stuff later on. We've, there's amazing editors out there that can help you if you struggle with spelling or grammar or any of that stuff that's not important. But it's about you kind of owe it to the world if you feel that bubbling inside you to share your story, to make sure that you do share your story, to get it down on paper. Or if that's not your medium, then to you use a podcast or create yeah. music or create yeah. art but every one of us has a voice and I think a talent that we're supposed to share with the world and so we're being a little bit selfish if we're keeping it to ourselves that's kind <laughs> of how that. I feel so oh, yeah. I love that yeah. I love that yeah because because chances are if you're passionate about sharing something there's probably somebody else who's passionate about receiving that and enjoying that or experiencing those things that you can create right absolutely and it's amazing sometimes I think um for myself I'm very introverted and um I've got ADHD and so throughout my life I've felt very different or like misunderstood people don't understand me and I think a lot of us actually feel that way that no one kind of gets us and it's amazing when you put your words out there or when you're fully being yourself how yeah. much that resonates other people pick up on their authenticity and hmm. it really does resonate and it gives them permission so by us putting our work out there and being authentically ourselves we're giving other people permission that it's okay that it's safe to do so yeah. that they can be themselves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Now, uh, you also, and, and I, was, I was delighted and, and surprised to find you were familiar with chapters in Indigo here in Canada, because you actually were living in Canada for a while, and you've actually worked as a bookseller. Yeah. Yeah, the, it was a long time ago, but it was, oh, such a fabulous job. I um. Uh, went over to Canada on a working holiday visa okay. probably yeah so long ago honestly uh, in my early 20s and my first job I got was in chapters and I just loved it and there's something about uh, bookstores that I think and maybe I'm wrong and I hope no one takes offense but they really do attract quirky people who work there <laughs> which is fantastic because I just met the coolest people, the coolest people working in chapters and uh, yeah, and Indigo and all the rest of it when I kind of moved around a little bit there. Right. In fact, I met my husband at chapters. So oh, you met your husband at chapters. Was he a Canadian? Yeah, he's Canadian. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and you brought him yeah, back to so the homestead, even... right? You brought him back to yeah. the homeland. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, it's kind of funny, but yeah, it's nice to be able to, as an author, have a little bit of a background of what it's like behind the scenes. Like, well, not behind the scenes, but um, when your books are out there on right. the shelves and you know, a little bit more about how books get selected and merchandised and their longe longe longevity, if I can speak, longevity on the shelves if you're a new author because it's not very long at all. And yeah. I think there's things that a lot of um, authors would be surprised about in regards to if they've got grandiose ideas about what a book signing can be like right. or once you get traditionally published um all the effort that a traditional publisher is going to put into marketing your book <laughs> and yeah um so I had a little bit of those insights from my experience in uh, working in bookstore so yeah but it didn't stop you right it didn't uh the the reality of the situation didn't stop you from pursuing writing no, if anything, it showed me or made clearer to me what I do and don't want out of an uh, author career. Right. And so I have, for the moment, I have gone, um, so I'm the self-published route, and that was by choice. Right. And there was a lot of things that went into that. Um, part of it is because I don't like being dependent on anybody else and their time frames, and I like having the control and everything like that. But also... 
um, I want to get my words out there. I want to entertain and I want to inspire and I want to engage people on, on my terms rather than having to wait for the book to be published and through mm. traditional routes and then getting maybe a couple of weeks on a shelf if I'm lucky and then if it's not yeah. selling then it gets pulled and right. and and I remember seeing what happens to those books in the back room when they get returned um to the publisher and it's it's really um quite disturbing <laughs> so yeah. yeah well especially in the mass market world that was one of the most devastating mm -hmm. shocking things I ever saw I tried I tried to buy the books so that they wouldn't get ripped yeah. you know I oh. know yeah and for, that, for anyone yeah. that's listening and is wondering like so when I was working there and I don't know if things have changed but we would have to um, pull books off the shelf to be sent back to the publisher and they go into the back room and then this is horrible and I hate saying it, but we had to rip the covers of these books. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And was... that's because of the economics of shipping it back to mm. the publisher it was far cheaper because the cost of paper then of mass market production was cheap. It was cheaper for them to reproduce a new one than it was to pay for the shipping and the handling yeah. of the product. So that, that the barcode on the inside of the cover was an in, was different, different publishers had different, you know, were full yeah. covers, front cover, cover and spine that had to be uh, put. And then that way you could mail some like, you know, 300 books in a, in a little yeah. padded envelope. That was honestly, that was still one of the most shocking things as, as a book nerd uh, that I ever experienced. When I walked in and saw one of my colleagues who was going to train me ripping a cover off a book, I went, what are you doing? I honestly, it felt like murder. It felt like yeah. murder. And yeah, so my husband, um, that was one of his jobs because he actually ended up working at Chapters as well. I didn't oh hire him, I, you know, but he ended up like, working He's there. cute, I'll hire him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that wasn't how it worked. <laughs> But um, yeah, and I remember how much, because um, he really enjoys books too, but he hated it and uh, he used yeah. to argue against it. And yeah, yeah um, it's real, it's really heartbreaking. <laughs> it, re it really, really is. Now, the other experience that you've had to sort of see the other side of things is as a librarian, right? Not another place where authors aspire to be and to appear. Yeah. Uh, now, how, how is the your experience as a librarian? Uh, impacted your your world as a writer yeah it's well it, I had to try it out because it's quite different than being a bookseller or in a bookstore a lot of it to be honest I found quite monotonous because it's a lot of shelving yeah. and you know keeping all the shelves nice and tidy and alphabetical and all the rest of it um, but it was nice being able to talk to people who came into the library who were browsing in there and the different things that libraries will put on uh, book readings and um, little things like uh, book weeks and things like that for kids. And, and it, what was really cool is when you work in a library, just like in a bookstore, I guess, but you, you love books, you, you read, but you've got more time and it's not about a hard sale or anything, but you've got more time to talk to somebody and show them, some of the books that might be a little bit more obscure even right. you know that are kind of hidden yeah it's it, it was it was really cool it was I couldn't it's not for me long term yeah. <laughs> um but I did enjoy yeah that different perspective and so I'm a huge advocate for having my own books available in libraries and that too because right. yeah so how yeah. what what are, what have you done knowing you know what the back the backstory of bookstores and libraries what have you done as an indie author to try to assist with um, getting the attention of librarians or what are you doing logistically with the uh, ebooks print books etc yeah so I have my books at the moment as ebooks and uh, my novels as paperbacks but I'll be putting all my books into paperbacks and looking at hardcovers and audio as well uh, hopefully a little bit more this year uh, but I so I do quite a bit of um, social media where I can mm -hmm. uh, talking uh, and 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 advertising through my newsletter and things like that too about you know these books are available in libraries like you don't have to buy that's that's fine and to encourage people that if it's not in the physical library 
to just go talk to your librarian and they're really good at getting your books in and I kind of do a lot of that by word of mouth too because I don't want our libraries to disappear I think they're a real essential resource for us so yeah I don't want them to disappear at all and as far as with the bookstores and things like that it's I've not like gone out of my way to um, go for a book signings or anything like that because I've seen I've seen good ones and I've seen a lot that were not great so mm. it makes me really aware about how I go about promoting my books but also there is a little bit of that you got to fake it a little bit you got to if you're an introvert and you're more of a quieter person you and if you're doing a book signing or something that's not the time to be a quiet person that's a time you need to be particularly if you're a relatively new author you need to be up and moving around and engaging with customers because nobody's going to come to you and so I do keep that kind of thing in the back of my mind about no one's going to sell your books as well as you are going to no one's going to advocate for your books as much as you are going to so you have to be your own best cheerleader yeah you have to yeah, and even if maybe you're not completely feeling that and you're feeling a little bit like a fraud or a little bit of imposter syndrome, you, you kind of got to get over yourself and just, yeah, you got to do it. You, you got to advocate for your books if you want to make sales and yeah. Oh, love that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so the podcast that, uh, the Alchemy for Authors, how long have you been running the podcast? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, not for long. Um, I... It's almost coming up a year, it's, so it's oh. relatively new. And um, up until recently, I was putting out an episode every week, which was pretty hardcore because mm-hmm. um, a lot goes into these episodes. Um, so now I've just kind of backed off for not sure how long, but just every second week. It's okay. not going anywhere. I'm loving the podcast. Right. Uh, but yeah, so it's a mixture of solo episodes where I share just my own experience with the knowledge that and I share this as well I don't know everything I don't know a lot to be honest I'm new on this journey so I am learning with my listeners Um, and that is why I have a lot of awesome guests on who know more than me that can share their wonderful advice with uh, other people and the purpose behind it really is to inspire and help people find the route to publishing and to putting their work out there that works best for the for them as individuals and I do have a bit of a focus on manifestation and mindset because I believe that mindset is core to creating a writing and author life that you love if you if you don't love doing this then (laughs) don't do it but I figure anybody listening to my podcast obviously loves writing or has big dreams and so I want to help people find the easiest most enjoyable route for them yeah I love that I love that and then one one sort of final question is I want to I want to take you back uh, with that mindset take you back to the five-year-old who discovered that Mm -hmm. magic of the library, the six-year-old who was so impassioned and and wanted to share the enthusiasm of the My Little Pony gift. What advice would you give to that younger version of Jo for her writer journey? Yeah, just keep going. I allowed myself to get so sidetracked along the way of trying to fit in and trying to do what felt was right getting those proper paying jobs and the sales jobs and all those things and pushing it aside but I think if I could have grabbed her confidence at the time and just kept it all those years through the angsty teens and everything like that I would have been in a completely different place and so it's really just keep that child you know alive and I've heard of people who will even um take a photo of themselves as a youngster you know when when you believed in yourself and the world was your oyster and anything could happen and to put it on your mirror or put it somewhere where you're going to look at it every day to remind yourself that you're doing it for them you know like you want to make yourself proud right you want to make so I want to make little Joe proud and yeah so 
yeah so that's that's something that I think we all need to just think about I mean we're this is really morbid but every day we're closer to death right yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. every day so how do you want to spend your life yeah. and if you've been putting something off all this time because you're scared or you don't think you're good enough or whatever other reason there's no good time to start something so you might as well do it now right yeah i love yeah. that uh, i can probably say with conviction that the little joe in the top corner of your mirror <laughs> is probably very very proud of the things you are doing and uh, in your own writing life, but also to help inspire younger writers and listeners of your podcast. So thank you for doing that. Can you can you please share uh, where my listeners can find out more about you, your podcast, etc. online? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a website. It's simply joebuer.com. So that's J-O-B-U-E-R.com. Uh, and I have links to everything on there. So I've got my books, I've got um, social media, handles and everything so you can find me on instagram and facebook at joe buer author and yeah alchemy for authors is available i think on most podcast platforms just search for alchemy for authors it's on spotify and amazon and uh, apple podcasts and all those good places and on my website as well and yeah same with my books they're wide so you can pretty much get them anywhere awesome yeah. Joe, thanks so much for hanging out with me here today. Oh, thank you. It has been such a blast. Thanks, Mark. That was such a fun conversation with Joe. And there's, there's a couple things I wanted to reflect on. It was, she, she talked about how you, you sometimes have to fake it. And so she, she's an introvert, you know, having to fake being an extrovert for, for her podcast, right? Or for, you know, book signings and, and things like that. And... And I think about that in many ways because I do it all the time. I'm actually, a, I used to be called shy, so I always I defined myself as a shy person, which is, you know, from a lot of people that know me from the industry go, you, shy? Uh, but that was the persona that was always pushed on to me from my parents when I was growing up, that I was shy. That's because everyone in my family was a, a blabbermouth. <laughs> just, just, they wouldn't shut up. So I couldn't get a word in edgewise. So I just kind of rolled with, went with the flow, rolled with the punches, and just kind of shut up and let them just go on and on and on and on. I love them to death. I'm just jokingly saying everyone just like they talked all the bloody time. So of course I looked quiet in comparison to them, but hey, I was absorbing a lot. And so I had this persona of myself as shy, but I am, I call myself an omnivert, and um, and what that means is, in a nutshell, I, I have to get into the extrovert mode, and I'm by default not into it, I just love being by myself, I love solitude, you know, which is why writing suits me very, very well, I also, when I'm in it, I love people, but it's that anticipation of getting into the people thing that is terrifying for me. And when I walk into a room, I'm just terrified. I walk into a room and, and I will, if I see someone I know, I'll just rush over to them. It's like, oh, I know you. Yay, I know you. <laughs> I'm so, so happy and so excited. But usually uh, if I have a purpose, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I, I, there's something I need to ask them or tell them, hey, hey, I read your book or I listened to your podcast and, and you're amazing. So that gives me a purpose and gives me the confidence to go into the room. Because what I really want to do when I walk into a big room is I want to just go shuffle off into the corner and hide. Now, it's hard for a guy who looks like me, six foot three, you know, very tall, bald, sort of menacing looking. It's hard for somebody like me to hide because I'm kind of big and, I, and I'm right out there. But I'm also very lucky in that my voice has been heard by a lot of people from the author community, from probably most likely from the Joanna Penn, uh, the Creative Penn podcast, but from from various podcasts and shows in my roles at Kobo and draft to digital and you know, previously in the Booksellers Association here in Canada, you know, I have, my voice has been out there and people have seen me out in the community. So I'm very recognizable. I still remember uh, meeting uh, Jeff Adams and Will now, uh, now um, and they're from the Big Gay Fiction podcast. And I remember 
I was at a conference in Atlanta. I think it was Romantic Times. And the first time I met these, they're just awesome. I think I was down in the shop getting something for breakfast, a coffee and a sandwich or something like that. And then I heard this voice that like they recognized my voice and they came over and, and we just hit it off right away. Just great guys. And but they recognized my voice from hearing me on Joanna Penn's podcast a number of times. And and I love that because a i can be lazy and people recognize me and i'm always more than willing when when somebody wants unless you know i'm in the midst of something really chaotic or whatever and i can't but for the most part i will always have time for somebody who approaches me and says hey uh whatever you know they want to ask me a question or or just talk or whatever i'm i'm always open for that so it's not like I'm, I'm shy and I'll run away when someone comes to talk to me. It, because the other thing, too, is because I'm not good at approaching people, when somebody has the, the, the courage and guts to approach me, damn right I'm going to give them a full time of day. Anyways, just a long way. See, I'm doing the babbling now at the end of the podcast rather than at the beginning. But that's just my way of saying that I play a role for a lot of people in the industry and and when I'm an author and I'm expected to do a talk or a presentation or whatever it is a reading whatever it is I prepare for the role and and I go back to acting and I go back to what I learned from acting and even book selling about playing the role and delivering what people are expecting which we do as writers right you're supposed to deliver in the story you're supposed to deliver for that target audience and so I I apply that same writing principle in my life and even if i am not feeling the confidence internally even if i'm not feeling like an extrovert that i just would rather be by myself and quiet when i'm there either on stage or in public and 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 engaging i'm faking it until i make it and i'm faking it in a way that demonstrates okay I've got to go through this people expect me to be whatever so I'm going to be whatever and usually here's the cool thing this is why this is the whole point of this long rambling reflection is that usually once I start to fake it once I start to dress for the role that I want to be like the Batman costume or the Spider-Man costume or whatever it is that helps me with the confidence it helps me get into the role it helps me feel it by experiencing it it's almost kind of like you know uh, a roller coaster is always the most terrifying for me that very very first as you're slowly creeping up and i'm terrified of height so as you're slowly slowly creeping up and you're just about to go over the edge once i'm once once that edge once we go down i'm fine i'm having a blast prior to that i'm having a heart attack and a stroke and every i'm just terrified gotta check my my underwear you know it is not a good experience for i'm i am a miserable mess as that roller coaster is going up and it's the same thing prior to going on stage i am still i used to have to throw up before i i spoke in public just before i went on stage now i still i get nervous and i still get anxious but once I'm on stage, I'm fine. It's the anticipation. And so that's where Joe's sometimes you got to fake it comes in. Because sometimes I just got to fake it and pretend that I'm not terrified and get out there and start doing it. Once I start doing it, it starts to work. Just like the writing warm-up exercise. Once I'm in the flow of the writing, it's working. So anyway, that's just a long way of saying, yeah, I really resonate with that. Sometimes you've got to fake it. The other thing that, you know, and this is the thing she said at the very end, and I just, and I thought about that, and I thought about her story about being that six-year-old, and I remember being that six-year-old so proud, so proud. I was like, oh yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna really take notice of this great writing of mine, and I'm doing something unique with my uppercase characters. (laughs) That was so, that was so adorable. I love that story, but I love that advice she said, taking a photo of yourself, you know, back when you believed in the possibilities think about this when we start off as children we are rife with powerful imaginations passion and thirst and open-mindedness and enthusiasm for everything and sometimes that gets taken away from us sometimes that gets beat out of us not physically but metaphysically and emotionally and and we lose that enthusiasm and that passion and those things and 
<laughs> going through a lot of photo, photo albums recently, old photo albums, and I love the idea. You get that, that photo of yourself when you were young and believed in magic and all the things that, the possibilities. And I, and I th- even think back to my own son and just how amazing, you know, when I, I, I reflect on, on issues like racism and all the things that tear us apart and divide people. And I think about the openness with which my son always, always approached life. And he was just open about loving everyone and and being a part of everything. He was just so open. And I could see it so clearly. And I wonder, what happened to me? Yeah, I like to think of myself as an open person, but I still didn't have have it with the conviction that he had it. Because at that age and when you're younger, I mean, you don't learn. You don't learn about these things. You don't gain those prejudices until life happens to you and you start to develop things over time but I think about that enthusiasm and passion that I could see in Alexander's eyes as a child and I remember my own enthusiasm and passion and belief and the idea of of doing it for them of getting a picture of yourself when you're younger and just sticking it up in the corner you know I can I can imagine sticking it up on the whiteboard I have a picture of my son uh, oh my god he must be 18 months old uh, holding a Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> now public domain, Winnie the Pooh. This was a Disney version of Winnie the Pooh he was holding, a little stuffed animal. And just the, the smile and the enthusiasm uh, in his face. And it'd be cool to get a picture of myself. Um, I'm probably going to do that. Uh, there, there's there's a really fun picture of myself on uh, black, black and white, because, you know, that's we didn't have color back then. <laughs> 1969, 1970. And, uh, and just put that up there and say I'm doing it, doing it for them. Uh, whenever I don't believe, whenever I'm hard on myself, looking at that and just saying, oh, okay, you're being hard on this poor little kid. Stop it. Because we're, we're hard on ourselves. And I bet you, yes, you, I bet you, you're, you're harder on yourself than you need to be. Think about that young person. Think about that poor, innocent, naive, beautiful, imaginative, powerfully impassioned person. And whenever you criticize yourself, whenever you're too hard on yourself, whenever you do not give yourself enough credit or take credit for all the awesome things that you are and that you have done, follow Joe's advice. Take a look at that younger version of yourself and ask yourself why you're being so hard on them and when you don't believe in yourself and you want to try something and it's okay to fail. So you're doing it for them because they believe and they have passion and they have power and you want to make that young person proud of who you are and all the amazing things that you have become. So thank you, Joe, so much for that. I gotta go dig up a picture. <laughs> I'm gonna stick it out my on my whiteboard above the monitor where I do most of my writing. And, and and I love that. And so thank you, Joe, for giving me such great things to reflect on. Thank you, dear listener, for to listening to my reflections. And a special thank you, of course, to all the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash dark reflections. Just a reminder that a few days ago I posted I posted the there was a, a bit of an issue with Wired magazine, wrote basically a smear piece, just a horrible poor excuse of journalism of some writer that just took a dump all over Brandon Sanderson just it was mean-spirited and just it was just uncalled for and Brandon's response to that article and I'll post a link to that in the show notes but what I did is in for my patrons for all the awesome people who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash dark reflections I just did an audio uh, I, I read version. Uh, I read what Brandon uh, said in his response, but basically what it was, was it was professionalism. He was respectful and professional and asked people to not go after the journalist who wrote that smear piece. He asked them to respect that person who took a dump all over him. Oh my God, the high road 100% of the way. Would you mind So Meredith the cat is just deciding now is the time she's going to start to tear apart her little scratching pole. Because she knows I have the microphone on and it's close to dinner time. So anyways, I'm not going to cut that out. Normally I would stop, admonish the pets, 
and 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 but I'm just going to move on. I'm just going to move on because I want to get this recorded so I can get it produced and edited and all that stuff and then and feed the cats. I got to feed the cats and I got to feed the dogs. And then I got to produce this podcast so I can get it to you awesome listener. So thank you for being an awesome listener. Thanks for listening to episode 297. So until next week and episode 298, this is, as always, Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.